Well, good morning, everybody. Y'all doing okay? Yeah, man, I will say good morning rather than good night right here, right? Because, uh, I don't know, our transition from Sunday night to Sunday morning tends to, tends to come with a little challenge for us to be able to say uh, this evening versus, oh, wait, it's actually this morning. Uh, rather than saying, I know that I said it, I think, last week a few times. So today, here's what I need you to do. Anytime I say this evening or tonight, everybody just yell and scream and do something in order to get my attention that I said tonight. We've got to reprogram ourselves to say in the morning. It's so good to see you, uh, you guys and gals that are here uh, as family, a part of the celebration of baptism today and the life change that's taking place in these. We're so thankful that you're here. Thank you for trusting us with your families. We are grateful to get to live life alongside them, and we're excited to get to celebrate alongside you uh, during this time uh, this morning as, as we worship God the Father through through this life change. And and, uh, and then and then as we transition at this point now into talking about what we've been talking about for a week now, uh, and we're continuing our message in our series called Uncommon Love. You guys and gals, do you remember a time in your life whenever you were just happy? You were just full of laughter, and you laughed a whole lot. Do you remember a time in your life where, where you had that? Maybe it's whenever you were a little one. Maybe you grew up in a home where, man, you just laughed a ton. I know there are many of you that are here today that you did not grow up in a home that there was a lot of laughter, but maybe there was another time in your life when there was just a lot of laughter, and everything was, you just enjoyed laughing a lot. You know, I know that uh, for, for many, it is whenever you're little, and and, uh, and, and you're, you're dreaming dreams, and you're maybe you're thinking of being a firefighter, or maybe thinking of being a police officer, or, or whatever the dream is, you know what I mean? Maybe it's something as simple as one of, one of my girls, uh, back in the day, she was, she was like, man, if I could do anything I wanted to do in life, and her dream was to be a checker out a girl at Target. You know what I mean? I mean, she just thought that would be the coolest thing ever. If she could be a checker out a girl, you know, at Target, then man, that was great. I think we spent a lot of time at Target during that time, is my guess. But she just thought, and you know, there's so there's this this sense of we're kind of outside of reality, and and we're able to just enjoy life on this planet. And then what happens in life, right? What happens is then there becomes a little responsibility, doesn't there? The weight of the world begins to kind of press down. And maybe the, the laughter and the funniness and the frivolousness of life, it begins to get weighed down, doesn't it? And then reality begins to set in even more. The other day I found myself driving down the road. My kids are in the back seat of the car and they are just cackling. I mean, they're just laughing and laughing and laughing, and they are loud. And my truck is a diesel. It's already pretty loud on the inside. But then they were like over and above that so loud. They were just laughing. They were having so much fun. Do you know what I found myself doing? Telling them to be quiet. You've all been there. Don't you judge me. You've been there too. Uh -uh, no, no, none of that. No. See, yeah, I know. At what point in my life, at what point in your life, do we find ourselves where it is necessary that laughter is too loud? Laughter is something we need to squash rather than something we need to fan the flame of. And maybe you're, maybe you're at a place this morning where that's not you. You know, you guys find, find laughter a lot in your home, and, and, uh, and, and man, that is great. I know there are many people on this planet that smiling is not as prevalent as it once was. Have you noticed that? Maybe you've noticed it in your life, or maybe you've just noticed it in the people around you. But smiling is something that it just seems to be maybe less than it once was. Maybe the economy that we live in, our current political state, maybe personal circumstances, whatever it is that seems to be weighing down so many people has become a reality for you. You know, the, the, the challenging thing in all of this is, as the church, isn't there supposed to be a difference with us versus folks who are kicking the tires of Christianity or folks who are, don't want anything to do with Christianity? You know, there, there should be kind of a difference. But have you noticed how there may not be a difference? That folks who love Jesus versus folks who, who maybe are not quite there yet, kind of the same thing, the same condition taking place? I mean, we as a church, we talk about joy regardless of circumstances all the time, don't we? 
We talk about the joy of the Lord being our strength. We talk about bringing joy to people who are far from God. It's one of the things that we know that is helping us be a balanced church. And so we talk about this word joy a whole lot. The reality is, though, is that it seems to be just beyond the grasp of a whole lot of people on this planet. We want to top it all off. How we read scripture, we recognize there's actually a pressure that's on every single person who is called on the name of the Lord. There's a pressure that gets placed on each and every one of us that we should take joy. Or that we should choose joy. Or that we should live out this life. And somehow, some way, maybe it's something that we're supposed to be able to either manufacture. Or maybe our faith is not where it needs to be. And so therefore that joy is not present. Or whatever it is, we have this pressure that's weighing down on us to have some type of personality. Or to have some type of, of charisma or whatever. That just doesn't seem to come naturally. It, it's a pressure. That exists, you start to kind of question maybe what what may be going on. Why is it beyond our grasp? Why is this something that I seem to have to make up or I seem to have to manufacture? Or why is that? You know, we read the story of Paul and Silas in Scripture. And Paul and Silas, if you're not familiar with this story, Paul and Silas found their their um, they found themselves in jail because of their faith. And as they were in jail, they had been beaten and they had been mistreated in all kinds of ways. Their future was unknown. They weren't sure what was going to happen even the next day in their lives. They could have been put to death at any moment. And then we find that there's this reality that's taking place while they're in prison. We find in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, this is what they're doing. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And we look at that and we go, man... That is incredible. Here's my question. How many of you, after being beaten, after being spit on, after being just, I don't know, you're hungry, the future is unknown, how many of you would choose to spend time praying and singing hymns to God? Would that be your reality? It's kind of interesting. So we see this, we gotta go, man, I will tell you that while that might be a stretch for me. It's something I want. It's something I long for. It's something I go, man, that's not just Paul and Silas being optimists. That's not just Paul and Silas being glass half full kind of guys. That's, that's a contentment and a peace and a joy that's genuinely coming from somewhere else, is it not? And we look at that and we go, Man, I want that, and I want to know how to get it. That seems to be across the board. Whether today you're one of those folks that says, man, I've loved Jesus for a long time, and I've struggled finding this kind of joy, or whether you're here today and you're going, I don't, I don't know Jesus, but I've been kicking the tires of this dude named Jesus for a long time, and I want that. I want, regardless of what happens in my life, for me to know I'm okay. Well, today we get to talk about this. Today we talk about the fruit that is known as the fruit of the Spirit. This is stuff that gets born in our lives whenever we say yes to Jesus and we have what's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that takes place. And then all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, we get this whole bunch of fruit. It's, a one, it's, a, it's, it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's a one and done. We say yes to Jesus the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then all of a sudden we have what Galatians chapter 5 shows, and that is the Holy Spirit produces love, joy, and peace. The Holy Spirit produces being patient, kind, and good. It produces faithfulness, gentleness, and it produces this having control of oneself. This is the fruit, and it all comes in one, in one bunch, and we're kind of going, wait a minute, but I've said yes to Jesus, why doesn't this show up in my life more often? And we've been pursuing that. We've been trying to make that happen. We've been trying to have this stuff show up. And it just seems to be right outside of our grasp. When we look at these here, there are nine virtues that you see here. And people much smarter than me have determined that there are really three groups that these can be placed in. 
There are three groups that we can look at. And we're in the first section of these. And the first group is our relationship with God that is defined by love, joy, and peace. Okay, so we have a vertical relationship with God the Father. And then we see there's love, joy, and peace. And then from there we have a relationship with other people that we find patience, kindness, and goodness. That's where this gets fleshed out in a lot of ways. And then from there, we have the last three, which is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which really are articulated best as far as the relationship within ourselves. And so right now, we're in this first little section. We're going to get through the other sections in the, in the coming weeks. But right now, we're really determining today, we're really focusing in on our relationship with God the Father. And we're in the second piece of this relationship with God the Father. And so today, our key truth for right now, our key truth for this moment is that uncommon joy is living in the atmosphere of Christ's joy. Now, we're going to talk about what this means because that's a little abstract, isn't it? You read that and you kind of go, living in the atmosphere, what are we smoking today? You know, and you kind of go, what is... So, but this is the truth. There is this uncommon joy that is living in the atmosphere of Christ's joy. We want Christ's joy to be all around us. We want His joy to be in us, almost like the air that we breathe. We know it's there, and we know that it is important for life. We know that it is a must-have for life to be the way it's supposed to be on this planet. We long for this uncommon joy to be articulated through Christ's joy. Now, isn't it true that it's easy to see joy in the good stuff? Like we, we see, I mean, the Bible shows us that we can find joy in salvation, baptism, life change. It's really easy to see, and it's really easy to be excited and, and pleased about that. It's easy to find joy whenever we're reading the Word of God, and we're being reminded of the truth in Scripture. It's easy to find joy whenever we're praying and we're spending time with God the Father. We can find joy in those moments. But did you know that joy is something that exists even in the, the difficult times? It's something that exists, perhaps... Especially in the difficult times. When we face trials or when we face failure or when we face difficulty. G.K. Chesterton wrote this quote. He said that joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. Here it is. This is life to the fullest. This is what Bible talks about when it talks about joy. This is a secret to the Christian life. And that makes it different than just living a very optimistic, happy, all is well with the world kind of reality. The Expositor's Bible Dictionary or Bible Commentary helps us understand a little bit more. He says that joy is the virtue in the Christian life. And here it is, guys and gals. It's the virtue in the Christian life that is corresponding to happiness in the secular world. See, outside of the church, the, 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 we see that there's this happiness that is the pursuit we also understand that in a lot of ways, most folks would equate and they would make synonyms joy and happiness. The reality is, is that these two things are very, very different because on the surface, while they seem related, happiness depends on circumstances. It depends on your financial reality. It depends on the cars you drive, your house that you live in, the, how, how um, your children behave, all that kind of stuff. Joy does not depend upon circumstances, regardless of what kind of car you drive, regardless of what kind of house you live in, regardless of how much food is in your refrigerator, regardless of, of, of how your children behave or don't behave, that kind of thing. Joy is not dependent upon those circumstances. This is why Kay Warren, wife of Pastor Rick Warren, wrote her book, Choose Joy, because happiness is not enough. That's why she wrote this. We, got, we want joy because happiness is always going to fade. It's always going to fail. It'll be here today and it'll be gone tomorrow. But joy is something that can last forever and ever. John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus said these words. He said, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So when Jesus' joy is in us, our joy becomes full. Do you see what this shows here? The pursuit of joy is not something we manufacture, is it? In fact, we cannot produce joy. Did you know that? We cannot produce joy. It is important for us to wrap our minds around that. That's why we can't look at, at life and go, well, I guess I just need to put on a happy face and fake it till I make it. That's why whenever you think about doing that, it makes you sick to your stomach, doesn't it? Because you feel like you're fake. 
Well, it's because it's not natural. Because it's not the way it's designed to be. Joy is something that is not controlled by you and me. Jesus is the one who produces joy. Jesus is the one who is the center of joy for the Christ follower. It's Jesus' joy that we're pursuing rather than our joy we're trying to manufacture. It's very important that we understand the distinction here. So here it is, true joy. You ready? True joy is letting Christ live His life through us so that what He is, we become. This is why Jesus, as He's hanging on the cross, for the joy that was set before Him, He could endure that moment. There was actually joy in Jesus in the moment in which He's dying. That seems mind-blowing. But did you know that that same reality is available for you and me? True joy is letting Christ live His life through us so that what He is, we become. Now there's a man who's much, much smarter than I am. His name is Dr. John Piper. We're going to watch a video as he defines and clarifies for us joy. You guys watch this. Aren't you glad to be relieved of this pressure that this is something you're supposed to produce? I mean, we can, we can actually find some relief from this to say, okay, I can't choose joy to show up in my life. I can choose Jesus to show up in my life. And thus, joy can manifest itself accordingly. But it's not something that I just choose this happiness to show up and I choose this joy to show up. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful because those emotions are things that don't come real naturally to me. And so I'm grateful to know that this is something that is, is supposed to be from within, from within my spirit, that will then manifest itself in my physical. And I'm really grateful for this. It helps me be released. It helps me be released from a pressure that I have felt for many, many, many years. And I hope today it does the same thing for you. And so, you want to know the secret of joy? I know you're like, uh, Danny, Sunday school answer is Jesus. Yeah, that's true. It is Jesus. But you want to know how this kind of shows up? You want to, the secret of joy in our lives, how we are to live in this atmosphere of joy, and it not just be this spirituality thing that people are so, so commonly caught up in talking about. No, we want to talk about how we can know the secret and how we can genuinely live in this atmosphere of joy. So, good news is, every single one of us in this room, no matter who you are, whether you are a Christ follower, whether you are somebody who is seeking Christ and kind of wondering about Him, or whether you are somebody, as you sit here today, you can't stand Jesus. And you're sick and tired of people using Jesus as a crutch because you just know they're weak-minded people. Regardless of where you are in this spectrum, today is a day we can all find some common ground. Today is a day that we can all find something that is very uncommon on this planet, and it is the uncommon joy that everyone is pursuing. So no matter who you are, here we go. Here's the secrets, okay? The first three come pretty pretty naturally, probably not surprises to anybody in this room. Number one, the number one thing, surrender your life to Christ. Here it is. The number one thing you do in order to have complete, fulfilling, life-changing joy that's not something you're manufacturing, but it just appears almost like you can't control it. Surrender your life to Christ. David, he said these words. He said, restore to me. This is before Jesus walked this planet. Jesus, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So David recognized that God the Father is the producer of joy. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then he wrote a little bit before that. He said, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. So the most important thing we can do, number one, is to surrender our life to Christ. There's joy in the Lord. Today we know that that joy is best found through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we know that when we choose Jesus Christ, we can genuinely find this thing called joy. But if we want to possess joy, we must first possess Jesus. So number one, surrender life to Christ. Number two, study the Word of God. It's so important that we study the Word of God. And what we mean by this is Bible. That we open up scripture and that we're reading scripture. The reason is, is that then 
if we don't read scripture, we're not cooperating with the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit by intaking, ingesting, feasting upon the Word of God so that in the right moment, the Holy Spirit can bring to light those scriptures at the perfect moment in our lives. And this is a, and a way that we find joy is as the Holy Spirit manifests himself through helping us think through the scripture that we have read. If we don't have scripture in our mind and in our body, then it is impossible and we shortchange the Holy Spirit's ability to do work in us when we need him to work. And so we've got a number two, study the word of God. Number three, spend time with God in prayer. It's just like a friendship, right? Just like family relationships. If you want to have good relationships, you've got to spend time with each other. So we must pray to God the Father. We know that this is through Jesus, that we can have this relationship. We must pray to God the Father in order to build our relationship with Him. John 16, 24 says, Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. And here it is, you ready? Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So we've got to have this relationship with God the Father that we can ask things, and as He is able to deliver those things, therefore His joy is what is making us complete. So we spend time with God in prayer. Then the final one is this, and this is maybe the one that you've spent the least amount of time hearing about. The final one is to submit yourself to the control of the Holy Spirit of God. This is big, guys. This is where it boils down. This is where we talk about spirit on spirit versus physical reality and physical reality. It's very important that we understand the distinction and that we are to submit ourselves to the control, to submit our spirit to the control of the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. So in other words, the kingdom of God is not a matter of the physical that we see on this earth. The kingdom of God is of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, righteousness, peace, and joy, these are things that are manifest in the physical, but they are motivated or produced in the spiritual. And so we have to understand this Holy Spirit of God is the one who is able to motivate, or able to create this incredible spirit-led life that then we find ourselves living out in the here and now. Joy and the Holy Spirit, they go together. And so if you've not surrendered your life to the control of the Holy Spirit so He can bear His fruit in you personally, then you will not have the joy that He has promised to give you. Our eternity can be secure. Where we're not worried about what happens when we die. We know we'll spend eternity in heaven. But if we have not submitted our lives and our spirit to the control of the Holy Spirit, then joy is going to perpetually be something that we are chasing after and trying to produce rather than it showing up. It's important to understand this distinction. There's a, there's a, there's a pastor at the turn of the century, well, turn of the early 19th, uh, at the 19th century, in his early years of ministry, man, he was just, he was doing great work. He was working hard, working hard, working hard. He was doing ministry. There were things that were happening, but he just wasn't seeing a lot of fruit in his own life. He was seeing a life change in people. He was seeing all these things happen, but in his own life, he was, he was really struggling with finding fruit. His name is Dr. Walter Wilson. And one day he told his friend, he told a friend about this crisis. He was like, I don't understand. I'm a pastor. I should feel more. I should feel the Lord. I should sense God in my life. And I'm not. And so his friend asked him, he goes, well, you know, how's your relationship with the Holy Spirit? To which Dr. Walker looked at him and said, or excuse me, Dr. Wilson looked at him and said, well, to be honest with you, I think it's probably pretty non-existent. He said, that's your problem. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then joy and fruit, those are going to be things that are going to be impossible to have show up in your life. And so he kind of went away, kind of going, whoa, there's a, a bit of a crisis in him. He, of all people, should have this joy of the Lord in him. He of all people should have fruit. Well, a little bit later, he found himself in a, in a, uh, under sitting under a, a teaching by, his name was James Gray, and he was talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit in his life. And after it was all over with, he went to his hotel room, and he was in crisis because he recognized that there was a, there was a major block in his ability in, this, in his ability to have relationship at the level that he longed to have relationship with God the Father. And so he found himself laying face down on the floor and he prayed to the Holy Spirit, 
giving him total control over his body. Now, are you ready? See if this prayer is like your prayer to God the Father or see if it's a little different than the way you pray. He prayed these words. He said, I hand it over to you for you to live the life that you please. You can send this body to Africa or you can put it on a bed of cancer. You can blind the eyes of this body or send this body with your message to Tibet. You can take this body to the Eskimos or send it to a hospital with pneumonia. It's your body from now on. Help yourself to it. Now folks, most of the time when we pray to God the Father, we equate blessing with good news. Most of the time we tie a string and make a connection between God's favor on our lives with the fact that we have enough material on this planet. The thing that I'm here and have the privilege of sharing with each of you today is that is not what brings the fullness of life to you. We will always be dissatisfied if the way we're looking to see God's blessing in our life to be that we have enough money, we have enough food, we have our health, we have all of the things that people look for for happiness. If that is our pursuit and that is our litmus test that we are using for the blessing of God the Father, then we're missing more than half of Scripture. We're missing the Scripture that says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are persecuted because of your relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus. It is important for us to understand what is the motivating factor for why we live our life here on this planet. We have to understand that the Holy Spirit only brings His joy when He is totally in control. The chances are, as we sit here today, there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on in most people that are in this room. You see, we would rather like to manufacture or try to manifest this thing called joy on our own when the reality is that that is a spiritual condition. It is a heart condition that is required in order for it to show up. We want what we want in the here and now. And none of us are exempt from this, okay? This is all of us in the room. Every one of us, we want what we want in the here and now without the risk of praying a prayer like Dr. Wilson was praying. None of us want to pray that prayer for fear that some of that might happen. But that's not giving our life totally over to God the Father. We fear what it could mean to genuinely give our life over to the Holy Spirit, even though what the Holy Spirit longs for more than anything else in your life and my life is to bring us joy, to bring us fruit. And the reason is that most of the time for us, we desire for blessing to be found in the good stuff. We really desire that. And it's not bad that we desire that. We just have to understand the way everything works. The truth is, is that we probably can experience the joy of the Lord best through the difficult circumstances. It's easy when things are easy. Most of the time, we experience the joy of the Lord best through the difficult times. John 16, 22. Here's our promise, right? So you also, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Dr. David Jeremiah says it this way. Jesus' joy not only survives crisis, it almost seems to flourish in the midst of them. Many of you have this story. It almost seems like it flourishes. So today we got to wrap, wrap our mind around something. And this is huge. Wrap our mind around the fact that the truth that Christian joy isn't always laughter. Christian joy isn't always laughter. Christian joy at its core, are you ready for it? At its core is a peace that comes to live within you when you know that the really important things are all in order. That if your life is truly demanded of you today, there's peace. You can find yourself saying things like, well, you know, it's just money. And really mean it. Because you recognize that's something that's not, it's here today, gone tomorrow. 
wrap our mind around the truth that Christian joy isn't always laughter. But the irony to this is when joy is what is, when Jesus is driving our life and joy manifests itself in us today, that's when you actually find yourself laughing in an infusion room as your wife is getting poison put in her body to kill cancer. Joy. That's the irony. You can find yourself laughing in the midst of really hard circumstances, and you're thinking, how can I do this right now? And it's almost like you can't help it. It's because Christ in you is the hope that you have. And you know that the here and now is just here today. And it can be demanded of you like that. The joy of the Lord truly is our strength. When we've submitted our life to Christ, we're studying the Word of God, we're praying, and we've given the Holy Spirit control, we can begin to be okay whenever crisis strikes, whenever job loss happens. We can be okay whenever the, the, the weight of the world is on our shoulders, and, and we can genuinely find this joy because Jesus is who is producing that joy in our spirit, and thus it gets manifest in the here and now. You see, joy is a good feeling in the soul that is produced by the Holy Spirit as He causes us to see the beauty of Jesus Christ in the Word and in the world. This is what we mean by living in the atmosphere of Christ's joy. This is the uncommon joy that we all long for. Joy is always set in front of us no matter what. No matter what's happening. And we almost can't help but see Jesus in our circumstances. You know, the good news is, is in those moments where life is hard and we find ourselves laughing, God's not going to be like me. He's not going to say your laughter is a little too loud and you keep that down. He's going to go, come on, bring it. Because that's what I'm talking about. And that's what we all are looking for, isn't it? Where no matter what's happening, it's going to be okay. Because we've got things in order. Guys and gals, that's uncommon. Father, thank you for your Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for this challenge. Thank you for life that you've, you've, you've helped clarify for us today in, in so many ways. But Lord, I pray that you help us as we try to figure out. We try to, we try to figure out this spirit and the fact that our soul is spiritual and it is eternal. Our, our body is, is temporary. Our situations on this earth are temporary. And so Lord, may we find Jesus. And may we choose Jesus, and may we take Jesus, and may we receive Jesus so that your joy can be made complete in us. Father, will you help us? Help us to truly give our lives over to the control of the Holy Spirit so that the pressure is off. So that we are relying upon you for what matters most on this earth rather than relying upon ourselves and pursuing after the things that this world says we're to pursue after even though we know it's only temporary satisfaction. And then Lord, when those moments of happiness show up as a result of the joy that is our strength, Lord, may we enjoy and may we have a blast in the midst of those moments. But Lord, let us keep it straight and let us know what matters most. Let us choose Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the next few moments, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, as we talked this morning about uncommon joy, we realize that to have that uncommon joy, we have to have the love of Jesus Christ. And, and some of you in this room may have never, ever taken a moment or even realized your need for a Savior. And so... We want to offer, we want to, we want to give you the opportunity to receive the author and perfecter, the, the source of true joy, Jesus Christ. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. There'll be elders um, on the outside of the room, up here in the front, and we call it one of our brightest parts of our day to be able to just lead you to Jesus Christ and to, to show you who He is and how much love He has for you. A lot of the rest of you in the room, 
You've, you've known Jesus for a long time. You've, you've accepted him as a